Section 11 of The Black Dog and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Black Dog and Other Stories by A. E. Coppard. The Handsome Lady. Pettigrove passed Christmas gaily enough with his kindred and even his wife indulged in brief gaieties. Her cousin was one of those men full of affable disagreements, an attitude rather than an activity of mind. He had a curious face resembling an owl's, except in its color, which was pink, and in its tiny black mustache curling downwards like a dark ring under his nose. If Pettigrove remarked upon a fine sunset, the cousin scoffed, scoffed benignantly. There was a sunset every day, wasn't there? Common as grass, weren't they? As for the farming hereabouts, nothing particular in it, was there? The scenery was, well, it was just scenery, a few hills, a few woods, plenty of grass fields. No special suitability of soil for any crop. Corn would be just average, wasn't that so? And the roots, well, on his farm at home, he could show mangles as big as young porkers, forty to the cartload, or thereabouts. There weren't no farmers round here making a fortune, he'd be bound, and as for their birds, he should think they lived on rook pie. Pettigrove submitted that none of the tall farmers looked much the worse for farming. Well, come, said the other, I hear your workhouses be middling full. Now an old neighbor of mine, old Frank Stinsgrove, was a man as could farm, any mortal thing. He wouldn't have looked at this land, not at a crown an acre, and he was a man as could farm, any mortal thing, oranges and lemons if he'd a mind to it. What a head that man had, God bless, his brain was stuffed, full. He'd declare black was white, and what's more he could prove it. I like a man like that. The cousin's wife was a vast woman, shaped like a cottage loaf. For some reason she clung to her stays. It could not be to disguise or curb her bulk, for they merely put a gloss upon it. You could only view her as a dimension, think of her as a circumference, and wonder grimly what she looked like as she prepared for the bath. She devoured turkey and pig griskin with such audible veracity that her husband declared that he would soon be compelled to wear corks in his ear holes at meal times. yes, the same as they did in the artillery. She was quite unperturbed by this even when little Jane giggled, and she avowed that good food was a great enjoyment to her. Oh, tis a good thing and a grand thing, but take that child now, said her father. Resting his elbow on the table, he indicated with his fork the diminutive Jane. Upon the fork hung a portion of meat large enough to half-sole a lady's shoe. She's just the reverse. She eats as soft as a fly, a spillock in a day, and not a mite more. No, very dainty is our Jane. Here he swallowed the meat and treated four promising potatoes with very great savagery. Do you know our Jane is going to marry a house painter? Yeah, a house painter. Or is it a coach painter? Tis smooth and gentle work, she says, not like rough farmers or chaps that knock things pretty hard, smiths and carpenters, you know. Oh, Lord, eight years old, would you believe it? The spillikin. John, this griskin's a lovely bit of meat. Beautiful meat, chanted his wife like a pig we killed a month ago. That was a nice pig, fat and contented as you'd find any pig. T'would have been a shame to keep him alive any longer. It dressed so well, a picture it was. The kidneys shun like gold. That reminds me of poor old Frank Stinsgrove, said her husband. He'd a mint of money, a very wealthy man, but he didn't like parting with it. He'd got oldish and afraid of his death must have a doctor calling to examine him every so often. Didn't mind spending a fortune on doctors, but every other way he'd skin a flint. And there was not wrong with him, cept age. So his daughter ups and says to him one day, 
You are wasting your money on all these doctors, Father. They do you no good. What you must have is nice, dainty, nourishing food. Now what about some of these new-laid eggs? How much are they fetching now? Old Frank says. A penny farthing, says she. A penny farthing? I cannot afford it. And there was that man with a mint of money. A mint could have bought Buckingham Palace. You understand me. And yet he must go on with his porridge and his mustard plasters and his syrup of squills, until at last a smartish doctor really did find something the matter with him, in his kidneys. They operated, mark you, and they say, but I never quite had the rights of it. They say they gave him a new kidney made of wax. A new wax kidney, ah, and I believe it was successful, only he had not to get himself into any kind of a heat of course, nor sit too close to the fire. Astonishing what they doctors can do with your innards. But of course he was too old, soon died, left a fortune, a mint of money, could have bought the crown of England. Staunch old chap, you know. Throughout the holidays, John sang his customary ballads, The Bista Ram, The Unquiet Grave, and dozens of others. After songs there would be things to eat then a game of cards, and after that, things to eat, then a walk to the inn, to the church, to a farm, or to a friend's where, in all jollity, there would be things to eat and drink. They went to a meet of the hounds, a most successful outing, for it gave them ravening appetites. In short, as the cousin's wife said when bidding farewell, it was a time of great enjoyment. And Pettigrove said so, too. He believed it, and yet was glad to be quit of his friends in order to contemplate the serene dawn that was to come at any hour now. By New Year's Day, Mrs. Cronshaw had not returned, but the big countryman was patient. His mind, though not at rest, was confident. The days passed as invisibly as warriors in a hostile country, and almost before he had begun to despair, February came a haggard month to follow a frosty January. Mist clung to the earth as tightly as the dense gray fur on the back of a cat. Ice began to uncongeal, adjacent lands became indistinct, and distant fields could not be seen at all. The banks of the roads and the squat hedges were heavily dewed. The cries of invisible rooks, the bleat of unseen sheep, made yet more gloomy the contours of motionless trees wherefrom the slightest movement of a bird fetched a splatter of drops to the road, cold and uncheering. All this inclemency crowded into the heart of the waiting man, a distress without a gleam of anger or doubt, but only a fond anxiety. Other anxieties came upon him which, without lessening his melancholy, somewhat diverted it, his wife suffered a sudden grave decline in health, and on calling in the doctor, Pettigrove was made aware of her approaching end. Torn between a strange recovered fondness for his sinking wife and the romantic adventure with the widow, which, to his mind at such a juncture, wore the sourest aspect of infidelity, Pettigrove dwelt in remorse and grief until the night of St. Valentine's Day, when he received a letter it came from a coast town in Norfolk, from a hospital. Caroline, too, was ill. She made light of her illness, but it was clear to him now that this and this alone was the urgent reason of her retreat from Tull at Christmas. It was old tubercular trouble. That was consumption, wasn't it? Which had driven her into sanatoriums on several occasions in recent years. She was getting better now, she wrote, but it would be months before she would be allowed to return. It had been rather a bad attack, so sudden. Now she had no other thought or desire in the world but to be back at Tull with her friend, and in time to see that fairy may tree at bloom in the wood. He had promised to show it to her. They would often go together, wouldn't they? And she signed herself his, with the deepest affection. He did not remember any promise to show her the tree, but he sat down straightway and wrote her a letter of love, 
incoherently disclosed and obscurely worded for any eyes but hers. He did not mention his wife. He had suddenly forgotten her. He sealed the letter and put it aside to be posted on the morrow. Then he crept back to his wife's room and continued his sick vigil. But in that dim room, lit by one small candle, he did not heed the invalid. His mind, feverishly alert, was devoted to thoughts of that other who also lay sick and who had intimidated him. He had feared her, feared for himself. He had behaved like a lost wanderer who at night, deep in a forest, had come upon the embers of a fire left mysteriously glowing, and had crept up to it frightened, without stick or stone. If only he had conquered his fear, he might have lain down and rested by its strange comfort. But now he was sure of her love, sure of his own. He was secure. He would lay down and rest. She would come with all the sweetness of her passion and the valor of her frailty, stretching smooth, quiet wings over his lost soul. Then he began to be aware of a soft, insistent noise, tapping, 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 that seemed to come from the front door below. To assure himself he listened intently, and soon it became almost the only sound in the world, clear but soft, sharp and thin, as if struck with the fingernails only, tap, 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 quickly on the door. When the noise ceased, he got up and groped stealthily down his narrow, crooked staircase. At the bottom he waited in an uncanny pause, until just beyond him he heard the gentle urgency again, tap, tap, and he flung open the door. There was enough gloomy light to reveal the emptiness of the porch. There was nothing there nothing to be seen, but he could distinctly hear the sound of feet being vigorously shuffled on the doormat below him, as if the shoes of some light-foot visitor were being carefully cleaned before entry. Then it stopped. Beyond that, nothing. Pettigrove was afraid. He dared not cross the startling threshold. He shot back the door, bolted it in a fluster, and blundered away up the stairs and there was now darkness, the candle in his wife's room having spent itself. But as a glow from the fire embers remained, he did not hasten to light another candle. Instead, he fastened the bedroom door also, and stood filled with wondering uneasiness, dreading to hear the tap, tap, tap come again, just there, behind him. He listened for it with stopped breath, but he could hear nothing not the faintest scruple of sound, not the beat of his own heart, not a flutter from the fire, not a rustle of feet, not a breath, no, not even a breathing. He rushed to the bed and struck a match. That was a dead face. Under the violence of his sharpening shock, he sank upon the bed beside dead Carrie, and a faint crepuscular agony began to gleam over the pensive darkness of his mind with a promise of mad moonlight to follow. Two days later, a stranger came to the Pettigrove's door, a short, brusque, sharp-talking man with iron-gray hair and iron-rimmed spectacles. He was an ironmonger. Mr. Pettigrove, my name is Cronshaw, of Eastbourne. Rather painful errand, my sister-in-law, Mrs. Cronshaw, tenant of yours, I believe. Pettigrove stiffened into antagonism. What the devil was all this? Come in, he remarked grimly. Thank you, said Cronshaw, following Pettigrove into the parlor where, with many sighs and much circumstance, he doffed his overcoat and stood his umbrella in a corner. Had to walk from the station. No conveyances. That's pretty stiff. Miles and miles. Have a drop of wine? invited Pettigrove. Thank you, said the visitor. It's Dandelion. Very kind of you, I'm sure. Cronshaw drew a chair up to the fireplace, though the fire had not been lit and the grate was full of ashes, and asked if he might smoke. Pettigrove did not mind. He poured out a glass of the yellow wine while Cronshaw lit his pipe. The room smelled stuffy. Heavy noises came from overhead as if men were moving furniture. 
The stranger swallowed a few drops of the wine, coughed, and said, My sister-in-law is dead, I'm sorry to say. You had not heard, I suppose. Dead, whispered Pettigrove. Mrs. Cronshaw. No, no, I had not. I had not heard that. I did not know. Mrs. Cronshaw dead. Is it true? Ah, said the stranger with a labored sigh. Two nights ago in a hospital at Munsley. I've just come on from there. It was very sudden, oh, frightfully sudden. But it was not unexpected, poor woman. It's been off and on with her for years. She was very much attached to this village, I suppose, and we're going to bury her here. It was her last request. That's what I want to do now. I want to arrange about the burial and the disposal of her things and to give up possession of your house. I'm very sorry for that. I'm uncommon grieved to hear this, said Pettigrove. She was a handsome lady. Oh, yes, the ironmonger took out his pocketbook and prepared to write in it. A handsome lady, continued the countryman tremulously. Handsome, handsome. At that moment, someone came heavily down the stairs and knocked at the parlor door. Come in, cried Pettigrove. A man with red face and white hair shuffled into the room. He was dressed in a black suit that had been made for a man not only bigger, but probably different in other ways. We shall have to shift her down here now, he began. I was sure we should. The coffin's too big to get round that awkward crook in these stairs when it's loaded. In fact, tis impossible. Better have her down now fore we put her in, or there'll be an accident on the day as sure as judgment. The man, then noticing Cronshaw, said, Good morning, sir. You'll excuse me. The ironmonger stared at him with horror, and then put his notebook away. Yes, yes, then, mumbled Pettigrove. I'll come up in a few minutes. The man went out, and Cronshaw jumped up and said, You'll pardon me, Mr. Pettigrove. I had no idea that you had had a bereavement, too. My wife, said Pettigrove dully, two nights ago. Two nights ago? I am very sorry, most sorry, stammered the other, picking up his umbrella and hat. I'll go away. What a sad coincidence. There's no call to do that. What's got to be done must be done. I'll not detain you longer, then. Just a few details. I am most sorry, very sorry. It's extraordinary. He took out his notebook again. It had red edges and a fat elastic band and after conferring with Pettigrove for some time, the stranger went off to see the vicar, saying, as he shook hands, I shall, of course, see you again when it is all over. How bewildering it is, and what a shock it is, from one day to another, and then nothing, and the day after tomorrow they'll be buried beside one another. I am very sorry, most sorry. I shall, of course, come and see you again when it is all over. After he had gone, Pettigrove walked about the room, murmuring, She was a lady, a handsome lady. And then, still murmuring, he stumbled up the stairs to the undertaker's. His wife lay on the bed in a white gown. He enveloped her stiff, thin body in a blanket and carried it downstairs to the parlor. The others, with much difficulty, carried down the coffin, and when they had fixed it upon some trestles, they unwrapped Carrie from the blankets and laid her in it. Caroline and Carrie were buried on the same day in adjoining graves, buried by the same men, and as the ironmonger was prevented by some other misfortune from attending the obsequies, there were no other mourners than Pettigrove. The workshop sign of the tall carpenter bore the following notice, Complete Undertaker, Small Hearse Kept, and therefore it was he who ushered the handsome lady from the station on that bitter day. Frost was so heavy that the umbrage of pine and fir looked woolly, thick gray swabs. Horses stood miserably in the frozen fields, breathing into any friendly bush. Rooks pecked industriously at the tough pastures, but wiser fowls, unlike the fabulous good child, could be neither seen nor heard. And all day someone was grinding corn at the mill house, 
The engine was old and kept on emitting explosions that shook the neighborhood like a dreadful bomb. Pettigrove, who had not provided himself with a black overcoat and therefore wore none at all, shivered so intensely during the ceremony that the keen edge of his grief was dulled, and indeed from that time onwards his grief, whatever its source, seemed deprived of all keenness. It just dulled him with a permanent dullness. He caused to be placed on his wife's grave a headstone, quite small, not a yard high, inscribed to Caroline, the beloved wife of John Pettigrove. Some days after its erection, he was astonished to find the headstone had fallen flat on its face. It was very strange, but after all it was a small matter, a simple affair, so in the dusk he himself took a spade and set it up again. A day or two later it had fallen once more. He was now inclined to some suspicion. He fancied that mischievous boys had done it. He would complain to the vicar. But Pettigrove was an easy-going man. He did not complain. He replaced the stone, setting it more deeply in the earth and patting the turf more firmly around it. When it fell the third time he was astonished and deeply moved. But he was no longer in doubt and as he once more made a good upheaval by the grave in the dusk, he said in his mind, and he felt too in his heart, that he understood. It will not fall again, he said, and he was right. It did not. Pettigrove himself lived for another score of years, during which the monotony of his life was but mildly varied, he just went on registering births and deaths and rearing little oaks and pines, firs and sycamores. Sentimental deference to the oft-repeated wish of his wife led him to join the church choir and sing its anthems and hymns with a secular blitheness that was at least mellifluous. Moreover, after a year or two, he did become a parish councillor and in a modest way was something of a shining light. If I were you, observed an old countryman to him, and I had my way. I know what I would do. I would live in a little house and have a quiet life, and I wouldn't care the toss of a halfpenny for nothing and nobody. In the time of May, always, Pettigrove would wander in tall great wood, as far as the hidden pleasance, where the hawthorn so whitely bloomed. None but he knew of that, or remembered it, and when its dying petals were heaped upon the grass, he gathered handfuls to keep in his pocket till they rotted. Sometimes he thought he would leave Tull and see something of the world. He often thought of that, but it seemed as if time had stabilized and contracted round his heart, and he did not go. At last, after twenty years of widowhood, he died and was buried, and this was the manner of that. Two men were digging his grave on the morning of the interment, a summer's day so everlastingly beautiful that it was incredible anyone should be dead. The two men, an ancient named Jethro and a younger whom he called Mark, went to sit in the cool porch for a brief rest. The work on the grave had been very much delayed, but now the old headstone was laid on one side and most of the earth that had covered his wife's body was heaped in untidy mounds upon the turf close by. Otherwise there was no change in the yard or the trees that grew so high, the grass that grew so greenly, the dark brick wall, or the door of fugitive blue. There was even a dappled goat quietly cropping. A woman came into the porch, remarked upon the grand day, and then passed into the church to her task of tidying up for the ceremony. Jethro took a swig of drink from a bottle and handed it to his mate. You don't remember old Fan as used to clean the church, do you? No, twas for you come about these parts. She was a smartish old gal. Bother me if one of they goats didn't follow her into the darn church one day. Ah, and wouldn't be drove out on it, neither. No and she chasing of it from here to there and one place and another, but out it would not go, that goat. And at last it actually marched up into the pulpit and put its two forelegs on the holy book and said, Bah! Here Jethro gave a prolonged imitation of a goat's cry. 
Well, old Fan had been a bit skeered, but she was so overcome by that bit of piety that, darn me, if she didn't sit down and play the organ for it. Mark received this narration with a lackluster air, and at once the two men resumed their work. Meanwhile, a man ascended the church tower. Other men had gone into the home of the dead man. Soon the vicar came hurrying through the blue door in the wall, and the bell gave forth its first solemn toll. Hey, Jethro, called Mark from the grave. What do you say's the name of this chap? Pettigrove. Hurry up now. Mark, after bending down, whispered from the grave. What was his wife's name? Why, man alive, that'd be Pettigrove, too. The bell in the tower gave another profoundly solemn beat. What's the name on that headstone? asked Mark. Caroline Pettigrove. What be you thinking on? We're in the wrong hole, Jethro. Come and see for yourself. The plate on this old coffin says Caroline Cronshaw. See for yourself. We're in the wrong hole. Again the bell voiced its melancholy admonition. Jethro descended the short ladder and stood in the grave with Mark just as the cortege entered the church by the door on the opposite side of the yard. He knelt down and rubbed with his own fingers the dulled inscription on the moldering coffin. There was no doubt about it. Caroline Cronshaw lay there. Well, may I go to glory, slowly said the old man. It may have occurred to Mark that this was an extravagantly remote destination to prescribe. At any rate, he said, there ain't no time now. Come on. Who the devil be she? However come that wrong headstone to be put on this wrong grave, quavered the kneeling man. Are you coming out? growled Mark, standing with one foot on the ladder. Or ain't you? They'll be chucking him in on top of you in a couple of minutes. There's no time, I tell you. Tis a strange come-up as ever I see, said the old man, striking one wall of the grave with his hand. That's where we should be, Mark, next door. But there's no time to change it, and it must go as it is, Mark. Well, it's fate. What is to be must be, whether it's good or right, and you can't odds it. You darn't go against it, or you be wrong. They stood in the grave muttering together. Not a word, Mark, mind you. At last they shoveled some earth back upon the telltale nameplate, climbed out of the grave, drew up the ladder, and stood with bent heads as the coffin was borne from the church towards them. It was lowered into the grave, and at the earth to earth, Jethro, with a flirt of his spade, dropped in a handful of sticky marl, another at ashes to ashes, and again at the dust to dust. Finally, when they were alone together again, they covered in the old lovers, dumping the earth tightly and everlastingly about them, and reset the headstone, Jethro remarking as they did so, that headstone, well, tis a mystery, Mark, and I can't bottom it, I can't bottom it at all, tis a mystery. And indeed, how should it not be, for the secret had long since been forgotten by its originator. End of section 11. End of story. Recording by Jeff Clark, St. Paul, Minnesota.